Here is my review of the Nikon D800 as a second hand camera. Uh, this has been out for a couple of years now and there's hundreds of videos out there talk, giving you all the information about the specs. So I don't need to go over that too much, but it is a 36 million pixel camera, which can do full HD video at 1080p at 30 frames a second and at 720p at 60 frames a second. It can take full 36 megapixel photos at four frames a second and you can also crop it down to DX mode where in photos you can push it up to five frames a second and also in video you can do a DX crop mode as well where you get all the same video settings as well but in a DX crop center. So that's, that's a good bit. It comes in an awesome body, uh, very well built and creates amazing images. That's, that's pretty much the only part of the review that you need to know. <laughs> so, but let's go into, this is a second hand camera. Okay, the first of all, why was this such a big deal when it came out? such a big deal when it came out. This came out because, well, when it first came out, it was 2,400 pounds, or in America, around about $3,000 for the camera body on its own. So quite a lot there. So everyone's like, okay, this is, this is pretty expensive. What's the big deal about it? The big deal about it was it was the first camera to really go way beyond the megapixel race. Um, so uh, at the past, it'd been 12, 12, 16, 18 Canon with its 5D went up to, or 5D Mark II went up to 21, then its Mark III went up to 22. That's where it's all kind of staying. Nikon then went boom, 36 megapixels. I've done a video showing you the comparison of the size difference of the image area that you get when you're shooting with 36 compared to the Nikon, uh, compared to the Canon 5D Mark II, and also compared to the Panasonic GH4, which is what I'm recording this video on just now. So have a look at that. I'll put a link up there somewhere uh, for you to have a look at. And you can see the, the, just the sheer scale of the difference that you get with 36 megapixel images. It also was the first camera to really kick ass from Nikon with video. So it had full HD, 1080 by 1920 pixel resolution. Um, and it could do it at 30 frames a second, so that was fantastic. It was limited to 20 minutes at a time. Generally, you're never gonna go more than 20 minutes. Um, it could also do it 720p, uh, which, is still full, which is still HD video, but it could do it 60 frames a second. So everyone's like, oh yes, finally, I can do a little bit of slow-mo with this uh, camera. It also had the ability that you could do it in DX crop mode, so it'd take in the center area. So I meant also if you had any DX lenses which uh, didn't cover the full center area, you could still do full HD video with this camera as well. It just cropped into the central area, um, so it's covering the DX sensor part, uh, the, the crop sensor area, not the full frame sensor area. It also wasn't limited in any of its photographic functions. Uh, there's been quite a few complaints from users of Nikon gear about how some cameras are being uh, disabled in some sort of way. This one, uh, for example, the shutter speed on this one can go up to one eight thousandth of a second, which is a fantastic thing to have. The ISO of this one can go down to ISO 100, so you have the ability to shoot in super bright locations with a very shallow depth of field. Very handy. Um, it also, its shutter speed that it can do with a flash as well was the full 250th of a second. You can also do auto FP, auto focal plane, where it means you can go faster and 250th, you can go up to 320th of a second. And with the Nikon speed lights and other high speed sync flashes, you can actually go up to the 1 8,000th of a second uh, shutter speed with flash with this. So everyone's like, oh, that's great. It also totally rock the world in, in terms of its dynamic range. At ISO 100, this camera has 14 stops of dynamic range. Everyone's like, holy shit, that's brilliant. And again, I've done a couple of videos where I've been talking about just like, holy crap, you get so much ability to edit these photos. And also it has a, a fantastic uh, tonal gradation in the images as well. So if you've got bright sunshine to dark blue, the smoothness of how it goes, you just don't get any banding or anything like that. It's fantastic. One million times you cannot complain about the images that you get at this camera. What you can do is you can complain about how it really shows up, how crap a photographer you are, uh, how, bad your, how bad your skills are, but also um, how duff your lenses are as well. So when you're shooting with 36 megapixels, which is near medium format type resolution, 
um, then you need to have a fantastic photographic procedure so there's no shake there's no vibration focus is spot on and you're using lenses which are sharp uh, proper sharp not not kind of like oh i think that's okay the difference between a 12 and a 36 megapixel image that you get is it really shows up any faults that you have in your lens or in your shooting ability so with a nikon d700 you could easily run around smash 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 take some photos this one a lot more holding close to the body <gasps> breathing Gently pressing the shutter. No, no, just there, run and gun with this one, that's for sure. Also got a th thing there and a thing there. It also has twin SD cards, uh, not SD cards, uh, twin memory card slots. It's got an SD card slot and a compact flash card slot, which is handy for some reason. I don't know why they didn't keep them both the same, both SDs or both compact flash, uh, or push it to the next level, which was QXD, which nobody seems to have taken a hold of. Um, but uh, with this means you've got the option of, if you've got a, if you're upgrading from a camera which has only been using uh, CF, uh, SD cards, then you're absolutely fine. You don't, you don't need to fill them. You don't need to fill them both. Um, you can do it with just one card at a time as well. But it did also mean that what you could do is you could store video onto one card, photos onto another, do a backup on both of them, or just do like JPEGs onto one card and uh, RAWs onto another. So for wedding photographers, very, very handy uh, to have that like in-camera image backup system. At the other side, we've got a mic, HDMI, headphone, and connectors. In terms of uh, autofocus, this uh, was claimed to be pretty darn good. It could focus in minus two EV, which nobody understands what that means. Apart from that, it just means if it's quite dark, you can focus and this focuses very well. Generally a lot of the time the focusing will be dependent on the type of lens that you have in the front. If you have a pretty crap lens it'll be difficult focusing but if you've got a quality lens um, with good context of the camera then it focuses. Uh, I, I have not had any problems with the focusing on this in terms of speed or accuracy. It's been fantastic. Now the main thing that you're buying about this this camera is its body. I've still got the actual uh, what do you call it screen protector on it. Um, it's a solid body. It's so good and so professional. Um, it's got its little buttons up at the top, your ISO, your bracketing, your quality, your white balance, and a simple press down of a little thing here and you can change it from uh, single to continuous low, continuous high. There's not really much of a difference there. Uh, Q for quiet mode, totally rubbish, doesn't really make anything quieter whatsoever. Uh, you've got a timer and a mirror up setting as well. So that's if you're wanting to clean the sensor. Again, you can clean the sensor with this one. This one is the D800 where it had an optical low pass filter. The, there was another version of this which had the optical low pass filter removed. All that really does is takes another piece of glass away from the actual sensor and was supposedly meant to give you sharper images. However, there's drawbacks with that one. It was a heck of a lot more expensive, the D800E. It was about an extra 300 pounds extra. Um, but also uh, in high frequency images such as fashion, uh, where you have lots of clothes with lots of stripes or something like that, it really started showing up more, more uh, the, the weird spatial aliasing patterns that you get with high frequency silk dresses, oh, total nightmare, and you'd effectively have to add blur afterwards to get rid of this. With this, it had the optical low pass filter, so you didn't have this weird aliasing effect with high frequency clothing or material. So whenever you're actually cleaning the sensor, you're still never actually touching the sensor. So you can still happily stick in your cleaning wand and clean the sensor, no problem. You're not, don't worry, you're not actually touch, touching the sensor. With the D800E, again, you still, there were still other filters in front of the actual lens, uh, so you're still never actually touching the sensor, so you don't need to worry about the actual cleaning. You don't need to send it off to a special company. You can clean the sensor of this by yourself, no problem. Other things about the, the body is that it's just the lack of being cluttered. It's just not cluttered, it's just, the buttons are in the right place and they do the right things. It's got its AF on button, which some of you may go, I've never used an AF on button, but for a lot of videographers, that button at the back is very handy. Again, for a lot of kind of maybe sports shooters, instead of having the focus 
being activated by a half press of that, they'll hold down the AF button on the back to take control over the autofocusing during taking photos. And it, in some cases, can speed up the uh, rate of taking photos because sometimes the camera will be trying to autofocus while you're trying to take photos all the time and it just slows things down. Here, autofocus on there, you're holding it, you can just get busy taking photos. It also only comes with the four main settings, P, A, S and M. S and M. And, uh, and you don't need more than that. That's, that's one of the things about this which is just fantastic. It's not cluttered with user setting one, user setting two, user setting three, three plus one, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's just simple, basic, and with that, it speeds up your workflow and helps you get your images faster without faffing around. The body itself, the actual construction of it is very solid, magnesium alloy all over some sort of things. So this is something which you could have for five years as a hill walker and drop it down mountains and you will get scuffs on the body, but the actual camera gubbins inside will be absolutely fine. It, it's, it's not going to break. The shutter on this is also rated to 200,000 actuations, which means shutters, flaps. Um, so this, this can do you for years. If you are a wedding photographer, uh, you're doing this, let's say at each wedding, you can get up to about 200 weddings with uh, each camera here. So, so it's like, that's, that's pretty good. And, and again, the, that, that's just what it's been rated to. It could happily go on for a lot longer than that if you tried. To get the shutter repaired or replaced is around about a 200 pound charge from Nikon. They can do it, but to actually do it, I think it's about 200 quid. Okay, so that is all the good things. Now, let's hear some of the bad things about this. One, it's only four frames a second. Uh, it'd be cool if it could go faster. Video, uh, it's only 30 frames a second full HD. It would be cool if it could go 60 frames a second. There's a weird noise whenever you're taking a photo with, uh, with, <laughs> with the live view on. So normally, if you take a photo, focus on something. Oh, oh, oh I've got a timer. Normal. Nice, sounds good. Uh, if we then have live view on, come on live view. Listen. Ugh, it takes forever. So the focus and everything whenever you're at in live view or in video mode is a lot slower. Additionally, whenever you're in video mode, if you're taking a video and you decide to take a photo at the same time, what will happen is it will resort to a photo settings that you had before the video and it will stop the video right there and then. So it's not a case of, oh, take a video or take a photo and it will still record afterwards. No, it stops recording with other cameras that I've had. You can take a video and then take a photo and it will still be doing a video afterwards. Um, but this one, and, and it will be the same settings with this one. The settings are what they are whenever you had it before you put the live view on. Again, done a video about that. It's one of the things which annoyed me about this. The next thing is battery performance. Um, it, for me, I haven't thought that the battery performance has been that great. I got it down to 20% and I'd only taken 400 photos. To me, that's not that great. However, you've got to remember, I am doing it with optically stabilized lenses and I am doing video and I am playing around a lot with the menu screen on the back. If you are just a hardcore eye peeper um, and you're not doing any video, I suspect it'd be far more than that. But if you are somebody that's working from uh, video to photo to video to photo to uh, doing lots of live view stuff, doing uh, making sure that the leveling is all good, which it's got, it's got a double level kind of thing going on, liking that as well. So you can tell if you're uh, left or right or tilted forward or back. So that's always a fantastic thing in there. Um, then you may definitely want to be having getting extra batteries with this camera. ISO, ISO performance on this camera goes up to a maximum native 6400 ISO. There's a lot of claims of people saying, well, if the noise at that level is too much for you, whenever you compress it down to like a 12 megapixel image, then the noise is almost completely disappeared. And I agree. If you take out the color noise, uh, which you can easily do in Lightroom, the actual grainy noise that you get is almost non-existent if you're shooting at uh, 6400 ISO. And it, all it takes is tiny amounts of noise reduction in post-processing for it to completely disappear. So it's very impressive with that. If you are going above that to the H1, the H2 settings, the in-camera noise becomes a lot more obvious. However, I took some shots in total darkness on the screen, it looked horrendous. It had blue fringing, it, had, it was just, oh, it looked terrible. Brought it onto the computer, couple of bit of changes in the Lightroom, boom, I was like, that's, 
that's totally awesome. <laughs> so even if you're kind of going, oh, I'm limited to 6,400, actually going into the high modes, as long as you're editing the photos afterwards, it's, it, it works. It really does work. But one of the main things I would say is that you don't buy a 36 million pixel camera to take photos at super high ISOs so that you can compress them down to like a 8 megapixel image in the end. That's, that's totally not the point of this camera. This, the point of this camera is really the ultra high resolution and the huge dynamic range and the bit and color depth that you, uh, the color bit depth that you get with the, the uh, sensor at its lower ISOs. That's where this one really excels in everything there. Some cameras are much more made for their high ISOs, but this one excels most at its lower ISOs. But all cameras do, but this is what, that's what this one's about. The other thing I'm not a huge fan of is on the LCD, it seems like whenever you are trying to zoom in in live view mode, it seems not that great. Uh, I don't know if I can sh I probably most definitely can, but it seems like it's taking a low resolution video file to pump out to the LCD screen at the back and it just looks a bit pumped. So a lot of times I've taken photos as well and I've zoomed into them afterwards and gone, oh, that looks a bit like pretty rubbish. That doesn't look very sharp, that doesn't look like anything. Then I bring it onto the computer and I'm like, holy crap, these are amazing. Uh, so I think um, in the actual in-camera viewing of images, should really just be like, I'll just have a quick look to check that it's in the right place and all that kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't show off as well. Obviously, it doesn't. That's a 3.2 inch screen and you're more to be watching it on a 27 inch Mac. That's what you want to be doing. Uh, but what you would say is that you may be disappointed whenever you look at the images on the back of your camera and you zoom in, you kind of go, oh, that's, that looks really pixelated. And I think it's taking a smaller file, resolution file to show on the back of this. Additionally, there isn't, a, like for a working professional who just needs to get some shots, there isn't a, a small RAW. You can only get the 36 megapixels, unless of course you put it into DX mode and then it crops it down to about a 15 megapixel image RAW file, which is fantastic. But if you're wanting like the full frame and you're wanting a smaller RAW, you don't get it. So the minimum is around about a 30 megabyte file from each photo that you get from this. An eight gigabyte card on this, whenever you're shooting in its highest settings, will only get you around about 90 photos compared to if you're shooting in uh, like a, in the DX mode and a lower like a, a 12 bit instead of 14 bit and a compressed instead of uncompressed you can get up to around about 400 photos so a big difference in the number of images you can get um, from the full frame highest quality to the DX crop lowest quality obvious obviously so in the end I was trying to think who is this camera for it requires skill it requires investment because it's an expensive camera um, and, uh, and editing as well also needs an investment because you're going to be using massive photos and all that kind of stuff. So who is this camera for? So if you think about the types of photography in a, in a scale, they're not blocks, they're in a scale. So at one end you've got photojournalism. They just want to take lots of photos fast and quick and accurate. That's it, photojournalism. And at the other end you've got, let's say, modeling, fashion, beauty photography there. Well, that's where this one comes in. This one is much more over this area. So what else is in this area? So if you are a product photographer, if you're a stock photographer, if you are a fashion, beauty, portrait, head and shoulders, did I say fashion already? Photographer over that side, this is what you would definitely want to be using for those types of photos. High resolution and amazing images. As you pan across and you've got the kind of wedding photographers here again wedding photographers sometimes need to run and gun and just get the shots sometimes at the same time they're going we just want the most amount of dynamic range and loads of image image real estate for us to be able to crop in and edit and all that kind of stuff so wedding photographers again this one is kind of kind of there so in the scale this one fits in there as well so if you're a wedding photographer this but it will slow down your workflow especially afterwards with all editing of the photos and it will require that when you're actually shooting on the wedding to be far more concise and more methodical with how you take your shots. And the last group that I would say that this is actually the perfect camera for is amateurs. People who have got time to go hill walking, to go mountaineering, to like meet models and take shots and all that kind of stuff. Um, we have time to sit down and edit and all that kind of stuff. This camera 
is a fantastic camera because what happens is if you're an amateur, this affords you so much ability to, uh, to edit, to crop, to, cut, to compose your images afterwards. Um, with this dynamic range that you've got, you, you oh, it's just so good. So if you are not a full-time working pro, the Nikon D800 offers you so much learning potential that it really is, it has to be what I would consider to be one of the best cameras for anybody who is really upgrading in their photography. If you're a full-time working pro, you probably already have your camera gear and you're just doing minor upgrades from like a Nikon D800 to D810. That's the kind of stuff you're doing. If you are a, a journalistic wedding photographer and you're probably shooting with the D700, I probably wouldn't advise going for this because you're probably used to how the Nikon D700 works and you're not gonna see the huge amount of benefits you get with this unless you're needing to do lots of video or for some reason you're suddenly going, oh, I need ISO 10, 12,000 kind of stuff. Uh, but if you are coming up from like a Nikon D7100, uh, then this is such a monumental jump up, but such a professional jump up that if you buy this, you're not gonna be kind of going two weeks later going, oh, I've run out of ideas. <laughs> this gives you so much opportunity to really advance your photography, so much. And as a secondhand camera, what I would say is, this camera, when it came out, £2,400. The body itself is worthy of £900. The sensor itself, I would say, is around about a 900. Like, if it was a case of you got the same camera but you got to put in a different sensor, I would happily pay £900 just to have the, this sensor put into whatever camera body that I've got. If I had a, a certain sensor which I loved and I could get this camera body, I'd be up for paying £900. You've then got other things like autofocus and the, the extra memory cards and all that kind of stuff, um, which add on to the extra price. So I would say, yeah, at the price when it came out, it was 2400 I would say this is still a quality camera for £1,800. If you can find this in 2015, for 1,500, 1,400, absolute steal, absolute 100% fully recommend this, putting this on my website saying, if you're into photography, get this camera. And uh, I previously had the Nikon D750, I also had the D700 before that, and I find this camera a million times better, far less gimmicky and far better in every way uh, possible. Uh, lots of love for this camera, and the only things that I can say that can make it better are just things, or the only downsides I can say about it are things which I think could just make it a bit better. So faster frames a second, more frames a second in video, stuff like that. But otherwise, if you are really wanting to advance your photography, the Nikon D800 is what I would recommend to absolutely everyone if they can get it for around about 1,500 pounds and they've got that money happily sitting around, and you've got quality lenses as well already, just, just win, 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 win. That's what I think. So that is my full mega review of the Nikon D800. Uh, I'm now putting it up for sale. Um, I've got a couple extra bat batteries with it. Don't ask me you, if you're wanting to buy it. I've already sold it probably. Um, but uh, this is certainly a camera which if I wasn't already a working pro and already had my own camera gear, this would be the camera that I would definitely be going and buying. In fact, if my Canon stuff does die, I may just go buy this second hand. Uh, but at the moment, this is just something which I've bought for reviewing. Um, uh, but it is something which I would think if I needed an awesome camera for going traveling or something, this one wins, this one wins. Anyway, that's me done, that's me done. No more, no more. Okay, cheers, bye-bye. One last thing is that if you are on my photography channel, you may not know that I've got two other channels. One is my exercise channel, which you can check out, which is Don Bauer Exercise. Uh, I think the actual name is just youtube.com forward slash Don Bauer. And I've also got another one on this channel. Uh, so this is, I've got Dom's Talks. And a lot of that is going to be about well, me dealing with my first ever newborn baby, uh, little Logan Bauer. Uh, born on the 4th of September, uh, and so I'm, I'm learning to be a dad. So it's all my mistakes and all the things which I'm learning which are quite useful. So if you want to 
see more about little Logan and how he's getting on, check out Dom's talks and if you want to see, oh I've also got Dom's flights as well so uh, again I'm doing a lot of stuff flying my DJI Phantom uh, around the places uh, and also going through the, the process of getting the, li the license to do it commercially so if you want to see how I'm doing that check out the Dom's flights channel as well, I should put all the links to down below so thanks for watching, bye bye